Thank you, everybody. Okay. And uh, once again, we're into those parables in Matthew 30, which is a, in itself is a treasure trove of parables that Jesus gave. And we've probably, probably spent about four or five talks now covering them. There are going to be a few more too. But um, in our last delve into the parables, we considered an alternative um, view of both the parables of the mustard seed and the leaven, noting how many well-respected clergy and commentators have diametrically opposed views of what those uh, parables are all about, and having some spent some time going over these parables, reading and rereading, considering in prayer, all the relevant studies by others. I have to admit that in some ways I'm still a little bit perplexed about uh, as to whether the outcome for each is, is good or evil. And uh, it's just amazing, amazes me how many different views there are in it. This I do know and I'm sure everyone here knows, the kingdom of God, which they're all concerned with, is definitely coming to this earth. Amen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, it's only outcome is for good, mm -hmm. for the betterment of everything. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's coming to establish justice, and in this day and age, and especially in our own country here, you know, the things that have been going on recently, justice is what we definitely need. Um, it'll bring peace, peace to this earth. And boy, do we ever need that. I mean, we read about what's going on in Ukraine, but um, apparently in Africa, there are so many little wars and things going on between kingdom against kingdom. It's not funny. And uh, to bring equity in the earth, and removing all that is an offence to both our God and our Lord, and for those who rejoice at his coming again. Amen? Amen. That's what we're waiting to rejoice about. Having spoken these parables to the crowds at large, in this instance, Jesus then went into a house. We're not told uh, whose house it is, and really, to be quite honest, it is irrelevant uh, to what Jesus was sharing with his disciples at this time, because the crowds obviously couldn't come in, and it was really his close disciples that he was talking to. Um, having explained the parable of the tears, Jesus concluded that aspect of his teaching by issuing a challenge, not just to his disciples, a challenge to us as well. And he says, who had ears, let him hear. And basically, he was throwing down the gauntlet, as it were. Uh, what group do you intend to belong to? He was saying. Are you a good listener? And um, as I mentioned, I think on Wednesday, time I had a, a piece on the uh, internet says, uh, talked about uh, it's no use having ears open if your mind's closed or words to that effect, which is so true. And this is what Jesus was talking about. And uh, so what group do we intend to belong to? Are we amongst the tears? Do we burn the fire? Or do we want to be righteous, shining forth as the sun in the Father's kingdom? The fine women upon our bodies. Yeah. It is the same, you know, for every generation that has existed since Jesus spoke these words, these life giving words as they were. It is man's reaction to the word of God that justifies or condemns each individual. As I'm sure we all know and understand, and Jesus here was alluding to a receptive mind 
because we all have ears, but we realize that there are the physically deaf as well, and we don't include them, but we don't all want to hear. And I've been through that aspect in my life sometimes, um, especially if it's something that makes us feel a little bit small. It hurts our pride. And, uh, and, and it's loathsome and it requires a huge change in attitude. The scribes, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were of that ilk. And probably many of the priests were before Jesus' resurrection. It was after that point that a lot of them started thinking twice about where they were at. We know how much pride pays a large part in life's decisions. And the fact that the yeah, I'm all right, Jack, yeah, life's a breeze, I'm cool, you know, it plays a prominent role for the, she'll be right, mate, no worries, no problems, you know. People that find themselves in this position because they're comfortable with the status quo. It truly is only when we end up in the valleys of life, the trials and tribulations of this life that cause man to deeply reflect upon his life or her life and, and, and the manner of life they might be leading. It is that situation that causes humans to reconsider when things are not going their way. Is there something better than this comes into the mind? There's got to be something better than this. Just, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be doing this. This is no good. And what's, what can lift me out of the situation? There's a couple of scriptures in relation to that. So, um, Proverbs 16.25 informs us that uh, there is a way that seems right to a man, but it end is the way of death. And that is true. Man thinks he's got the wherewithal and his way is better than anyone else. And many dictators are certainly like that. But also in Psalm 10 verse 4, in the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him, that's God. All his thoughts are, oh, no, God. And we, that is so prevalent in this world today. Proverbs 16 verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And it's the fall that these people need. Some will respond in a positive way. Others will just get a lot worse, unfortunately. They're the ones whose minds are close. In 1 John 2.16, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eye, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. In the following three parables, of which John read for us tonight, we're really going to only going to cover two tonight. Um, in Matthew uh, 13, 44, 45, and 47, Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to three different aspects of life in the world. I remember as a little boy, um, dreaming of finding special treasure somewhere. And I bet we've all been there when we were little. Um, and when I was little, I enjoyed play acting as a pirate, seeking treasure by fair means or foul, because I didn't care in those days. So many of the children's books of those days, in many comics, they featured these fearsome sailors and gave them awesome status. And boy, yeah, that was great. Loved it. Later on, it became Superman, Captain Marvel, you know, some of these other great people. But initially, it was really quite the pirate things I, I was quite into. What Jesus presents to his listeners in this first parable um, within the house describes the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, synonymous terms, 
describes it um, as like unto treasure. And the Greek word here is uh, thesaurus, which literally means wealth, treasure, wealth, some of that. Wealth that has been hidden in a field. In those days, they didn't have banks. They didn't have places where you could put deposit box that you could put your excess wealth in or things that you got hold of. And quite often they buried it in the field. And if any of you are anything like me, it's amazing how you can put some money away sometimes for that rainy day somewhere, maybe in the car and out or something, and then forget that it's there. And then six, eight months later or a year later, you suddenly come across it. Oh, treasure! I've got an extra 20, 40 bucks. Ah, yeah. Yeah. And but what Jesus presents to his listeners in this first parable, it describes the kingdom like unto wealth that had been hidden in a field. What is interesting in this parable is that the man had what he found again. He put it back in the ground, covered it up. And then sold all his possessions so that he could buy the field. Obviously, that whatever the treasure was, wasn't his. Neither was the field. It would appear that he wasn't expecting to find such treasure. But what seems pertinent was that he came across it by accident. Perhaps after heavy rain. It had been exposed and something glinted in the sunlight or something was like a bag or something that shouldn't normally be found in a field. Then causing him to investigate and dig around it until he realized its value. The treasure had such an impact on this man that he immediately covered it over, made plans to sell all that he had so that he could buy the field. He wasn't prepared to surreptitiously sneak the treasure away, even at night, but was prepared to pay the price to purchase the land and all it contained. Having considered all these aspects of the scenario, what can we spiritually draw from the portrayal that Jesus has elicited here, what, he, what he's been talking about? First and foremost, we can easily discern the treasure as being in a situation, living a life commensurate with the ideals of life, the ideals we really look for. And of course, one of those is eternal life, is it not? And the things I mentioned earlier, being content, and justice and peace, without Sin's domination, ruling, as we know it, rules and reigns in life at present. And then recognizing that the day is coming when sin and death will cease and the godless will be judged permanently. As we've constantly sort of noted in these studies, both John and Jesus preach the kingdom of God, bring them back to the people. And Jesus demonstrated his Messiahship through all that he did and taught. Consider 2 Corinthians 6 and 7. I'd love to do that, but it doesn't seem to want to do it for me at this point in time. Here we go. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> for as God who said, out of darkness, the light shall shine. You shine in our hearts to give the brightness of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. This is all about what God has, what God has prepared, what God has done. His grace, his mercy were evident for all to see. This is Jesus. His power over the elements spoke loudly of his relationship with his, with his God, with his Father. 
proclaiming his eminence, his sonship in particular. And we know that Nathaniel in particular is the first one to bring that up. For those who recognize his authority, his, his status, he was a treasure like no other, as also that which he proclaimed, because they both went together. Consider John 1, 45 to 49. This is the story of Nathaniel. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, we found him of whom Moses wrote in the law and the prophets, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said to him, can there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. And Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. How would you like that commendation, folks? Mm. That is an amazing commendation. Nathaniel said to him, Where do you know me? Jesus answered and said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathaniel answered and said, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Amazing. And even Jesus was quite amazed by his reaction. Um, and uh, he said, you know, you're going to see greater things. You, you recognize me now. You're going to see greater things than that. Matthew 16, 6. 16, 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He recognized who Jesus was. He'd been with him for a while. He'd been astounded at what he could do, starting off on his boat when he just fell down at Jesus' feet and said, Lord, you don't want to know me. I'm a, I'm a sinful man. Man, yeah. But uh, in Matthew 6, 21, and this is what Kevin had up on the board earlier, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Luke 12, uh, 31 takes that a little step further. But rather seek the kingdom of God. This is Jesus speaking. And all these things will be added unto you. And he's talking about clothing, food, the necessities of life. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God wants to get it. He wants us to have it. So what? So sell what you have and give arms. Make for yourselves purses which do not become old, an unfailing treasure, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes nor moth corrupts. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Also, and Israel itself as a nation is quite important here because uh, when they were chosen, this is what God said about them. But now if you obey my voice indeed, and there is the crux of the matter for all of it, if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure to me above all the nations. All the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the sons of Israel. In Psalm 135, 4, for the Lord has chosen Jacob unto himself, Israel, and Israel for his peculiar treasure. And we as grafted in branches, um, now have access to the same creator and the same father of all things through our Christ, our Lord and Saviour, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit to work in our lives through baptism into his name. What greater treasure could we find in the world today, knowing too that this is life eternal? to know you, the one true God, 
and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. John 17, 3 talks about that. No, no matter what the world may think or do to us, we have a promised future. Um, even resurrection to a kingdom of pleasures forevermore on the earth. Our reward, our treasure, truly is in heaven at this point in time. However, we know that Jesus will return to this earth and bring his reward with him. And Isaiah speaks of this and also Revelation. Isaiah 40, 10, Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Isaiah 62, 11, Behold, the Lord God has proclaimed unto the end of the world, Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And Isaiah 62, 12, And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and thou shalt be called sought out, a city not forsaken. Getting back to the man in the field, that this man discovered this treasure without even having been on a treasure hunt is indicative of the calling of many people throughout the times of the Gentiles, and many of us here are part of that. I personally didn't go searching for a special book that spelled out the end of this earth as we know it, a book that transformed my thinking like nothing else I had in my life, and uh, especially at that time. And later, of course, through my brother Alan in a lecture given by our Pastor Barry, it truly led me to the greatest mm -hmm. treasure in the world today. And also represented too by the field, which is the nation or the world as it is. And quite often today, men stumble upon buried treasure, usually with the help of metal detectors and other machinery. However, the greatest treasure is available to all, only requiring ears to hear. And you know what? It truly is not even hidden. And, but as the saying goes, they can't see the wood for the trees. Mm -hmm. And the multitude of trees, that is men, that deliberately hide the truth as it is in our creator and sustainer and his amazing son which they do by sleight of hand, or rather sleight of word, have changed what is right and true into lies. In Jeremiah 16, 19, um, tells us about this. Not coming up. Well, Jeremiah 16, verse 9 prophesied that men will say at the end time, the Gentiles in particular, we have inherited lies. Mm. And we know that that's going to happen. That this man was not actually seeking, as we noted, um, as we note in the next parable, he came across it by accident. Not. No way. Let's look at what Isaiah has to say on the subject. Isaiah 65, verse 1. Yes. I am sort of them that ask not for me. I am found of them. And also Paul in Romans 9, 23 to 26 that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he has afore prepared unto glory, even us, whom he has called, not as the Jews only, but also at the Gentiles. As he saith, and oh, sir, as I, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, 
which was not below. It shall come to pass that in the place where the sound of them you are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Ephesians 1 verse 3 and 4. Blessed be the Lord God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So there's no way it is found by accident. God has done the work. Mm -hmm. He's prepared it before the foundation of the world. And from these passages, we can sell, well discern that this was a work of God which he has ordained before the word. Romans 8, verse 30, in 2 Timothy 1 9, have this to say. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, he may also call. And whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. 2 Timothy 1 9. Who has saved us and called us with an holy call? Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. When it comes to an understanding of God and his purposes, there is no such thing as luck. And I know that if John Orbis were here in life, he would be saying amen to that. And knowing as well that many are called, but few are chosen, as Matthew 22, 44 tells us, 14. Tells us. The question we need to ask ourselves is this Are we among the chosen? And we are called to strive for masteries, as 2 Timothy 2 5 tells us. And also in Luke 13 24, we we're told to strive to enter in at the straight gate. 2 Timothy 2 24 then implores us as servants of the Lord that we must not strive. And you think, what is going on here? Is the Bible full of contradictions? However, as we find in so many cases, the word translated into English, strive, comes from three different Greek words mm -hmm. with different meanings. In 2 Timothy 2.5, the word translated strive is the Greek athleo, from which we get athlete, athletic means to strive to contend for masteries by following the rules. And that's an interesting one in relation to our walk before our God. Mm. So that is right to strive for. Uh, as we all know, we're in a race, even a marathon. In Luke 13, 24, the Greek of agonizomai, which means to agonize, and we get our word agonize from that, to contend, to struggle, to contend with an adversary. And boy, yes, we're all in the battle, aren't we? And in 2 Timothy 2.24, the Greek is makoumahi, which means to war, to quarrel, to dispute, to fight, which, of course, is contrary to the spirit of Christ and not acceptable. Same word, different meaning. As we all know and understand, I'm sure, that our striving has to do with mastery over self. That fleshly inclination to have and do what we want. And we know that it's all about pride, the ego, the me, me, me syndrome. It's all about me. It alienates us from our God and his purposes and desires for our life. Does this parable tell us to go on and go and sell all that we own and follow Jesus, neglecting even our own families and our livelihoods? It may well be the call for some. Yes, it can, it did happen. However, for all to do that, how would they 
in the church truly survive. For those called to do so, God would and does provide. As the disciples of Jesus learned during, during his ministry, especially when he sent them out and he don't take that, don't take a script, don't take any extra, don't, don't take any extra clothing. He wanted them to learn a lesson. Um, he learned that during the movie, and of course, after his resurrection as well. And that was sent out all over the place. Remember in Acts 4, how those who had plenty supported those who lacked. That is, those that had land to spare in more than one house. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands, notice the yes at the end, and houses sold them and bought the price, prices of the things to be sold. And laid them down to the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need, not what he wanted, as he needed. And Job, Jesus, who by the apostles was named Barnabas, which is by being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. We know that another couple, and an item of fire did the same thing. They kept uh, the money back. And we know that put condemnation upon them and even death. Does this parable tell us to go and sell all that we own and follow Jesus, neglecting even our own families and livelihoods? That's the question I ask. But no, it was for those that had surplus. It's a bit like, remember that uh, farmer that had uh, a great crop come in and he decided, right, I'm going to build more barns, fill my barns up and sit back and live sumptuously and just you know, eat, drink and be merry and be happy. And God said to him, so I will do this now. Because you haven't used your treasure to help God's people. He wanted it all for himself. The homes were necessary for meetings and providing hospitality for others of like faith. So no, they didn't sell their homes. The gentleman in this parable was obviously not a wealthy man. Because he had to sell everything he had to buy the field. So he didn't have a surplus of money. We all understand, I'm sure, that entry into God's kingdom cannot be bought because it's a free gift. To those who recognize his son as their savior and that he has paid the ultimate price to redeem them from sin and consequent death. So just what does this field ultimately represent? What was this man buying, spiritually speaking? Let's have a look at a couple of scriptures in relation to this. Proverbs 23, 23. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Isaiah 55, 1. Hope. Everyone that's this, come to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. But that buying. Isaiah 55 2. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which satisfies not. I can do it ye unto me and eat ye that which is good. And lets your soul delight itself in fatness. You can obviously tell I'm in that situation. 
Isaiah 55, 3, incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. What did Jesus say? When he was talking to one of the churches, another very good church in Revelation chapter 3. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness does not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thyself that you may see. He's talking about buying something. So how do we read that? To me, we sell ourselves to Christ. We're giving him our life. We're giving him control over our life. Our, our price to pay is to receive his gifts, his treasure in our life. While I stayed here, the field represented the world at large and the nation in particular and what it has to offer. This, this field was special and surely it also represented all that God decreed, all that was right and true and demonstrated all that Jesus stood for, especially it related to the kingdom and the king himself. As we already considered, the treasure in this field represents all that God had prepared for those who love him, who love his ways, and who love his amazing son. Bound up in his ultimate purpose with this earth and with his people, his family. Jesus never minced words about the trials and tribulations his followers would face. Consequently, it was just as important to instill in his disciples that something infinitely better, even age lasting, eternal, was offered to those who strive to enter through that straight or that narrow gate. And that's what he was asking his disciples to do. I'm sure these men and women truly understood that anything in life that is worthwhile requires diligence, it requires tenacity, it requires hard work, it requires a strength of character, it rises above all the problems. Recognizing that the failings as good character and teaching tools. So when you get it wrong, you do something about making sure you don't do it again. In Matthew 19, this is 27 to 29, Peter had this to say. Peter said unto him, Behold, we've forsaken all and followed you. What shall we have therefore? Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, You that have followed me in this uh, generation, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, he shall also sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Wow. Wow. What a position. And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. An interesting question here that might go through people's minds discussing that people hang on how did these other people survive how did they survive god would ensure that they survived and god would have ensured that they received i mean mm -hmm. is that our god is that the way he works absolutely <coughs> absolutely So, in Matthew 19 there, Jesus ensured his disciples comprehended the true extent, the end position of their decision to follow him. He warned them, 
of certain things that are going to go in their way, but he also lifted them up and gave them something to really concentrate their minds on following him, doing that as they should. So the field actually represents the truth as the word of God, which over the centuries had been added to and detracted from by those who held sway in the land at different times. And just how the shackles of the law needed to be unlocked because of the weakness in men to fully comply to its requirements. And we know only one man was able to do that. While they at this point did not truly understand Jesus' full purpose and mission, they certainly recognized him as Messiah and son of the living God, as we've already considered. So along with his teaching of the kingdom, he and all he offered them through himself represented the treasure in this parable. Jesus was part of it. He was part of the treasure. He's part of the kingdom. He's the king. He's the saviour. He's the redeemer. So he's as much as part of it as anything else. Jesus was at pains to point out to them that nothing in this life transcends what his father and himself were offering them. No different for us folks. No different for us. A lesson that, that we need to be constantly be reminded of in this day and age. Second career, Colossians 2 has this to say. That their hearts might be comforted being met together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The most perplexing aspect of this parable is the fact that the finder rehid what he found. He certainly didn't want anyone else finding it and taking it from him. How do we read this? How do we see this? What can it represent? What we don't know is what he did with it once he bought the field, of course. Can this be understood by one who, having found this treasure, keeps it within his heart until he fully comprehends the full value of it and then feels at liberty to share with others just what he had discovered. Could that be what he's talking about here? Because we are told to hide these things in our heart. And speaking with a brother recently on that very topic, he admitted to me that this is what took place in his early days in the truth, um, he, he kept it to himself when he was being spoken to by flatmates. And uh, eventually, of course, it took its course and he got that tight and then it all came out. Personally, having read that book I mentioned on a couple of occasions, I initially shared with friends and acquaintances. And, you know, very quickly, I realised that they weren't so keen on my company from that point on, <laughs> which is interesting and very typical. Yeah. While I realised that I needed to do something about my fine, it was actually another six or seven years before God moved for me and provided me with a solution to my blind groping around. Because during that time, I was thinking, yeah, I really need to go to a church. But I was involved in a job, involved long hours, weekends away, and it just was not conducive. But God was in that, I'm quite sure. There were a number of occasions during those years where I had contact with Christian people. Yet both they and I never responded to any promptings. It may have occurred. Yet in my heart of hearts, I knew I should be searching for the right church to go to. And I didn't really know where to go. Fortunately, 
I found a treasure in a fellow worker under the vines in the orchard we were working, that we were both working at, who drew me to this very church about 40 years ago, just over. Here I am today sharing with others the very gospel that captured me. Praise God for his works among men and for the power of the spirit and that word that transformed weak, self-centered men into sons of the living God. And I know there are others amongst us who have a similar attention. The second of these short parables, in Matthew 13, 44, 46, 45, I should say, 46, while obviously teaching or symbolizing the same as 44, however, it takes place from a very different perspective, a different angle. And he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he has found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Obviously, the center of the kingdom of heaven is again the crux, the centerpiece. This time, however, the merchant man, as most of you, the word also means it, simply a tradesman, is seeking pearls. He's looking, and the word pearls means here means beautiful, valuable, virtuous. This is an interesting word. In both this and the previous parable, both are prepared to sell all in order that they may purchase something that has ultimate value to them. This is the pinnacle for these people. Paul's attitude to his calling emphasizes this point in Philippians uh, 3, verses 7 and 8, when he said this, but what things were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but done, that I may win Christ. What an attitude. We need the same. How do we view the merchant man in this parable? Can we envisage him as one that has been seeking wisdom, knowledge, and understanding most of his life, but in all the wrong places? Nothing satisfied his eager heart, his desire for enriching his intellect to bring satisfaction, ultimate contentment, or even something that could extend this life on this earth. The good aspect of this man is that he was willing to search. He was prepared to go to great lengths and spend all that he had to purchase this one magnificent pearl. And the only other time we find the word pearl is in Revelation 21. And 12 gates and 12 pearls. Every several gate was one pearl, amazing. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And to be can we envisage a strong relationship here between the merchant's discovery and the entrance into the holy city, even the New Jerusalem itself. Mm -hmm. You see a relationship in that? Mm -hmm. I certainly do. As we recognize that the holy city is actually heaven itself, and we recognize that it's coming to the earth, depicts the answer to the Lord's prayer, which we all know well. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. Truly, Jesus will come again and rule and reign, bringing righteousness, peace, justice, healing, and contentment to a man made corrupt world. This merchant, tradesman, had found the answer to all his searching and was willing to give up all to buy it. While we all know and understand that we can't buy our way into God's kingdom, 
We surely realize that our redemption came at a great price. And just as the sacrifices under the law were acceptable for Yahweh to recover in sin, so today those that recognize that the last Adam, even Jesus himself, the Lamb of God, offered up himself to appease for our sins. And upon recognizing him as our greatest treasure, even our free gift, when we look to him and receive him as our Lord and Savior, we too can be ears with him. Amazing. Mm -hmm. We can be ears, simple, ordinary folk like us who are nothing in this world. In his glorious kingdom, what more can we ask for? What greater treasure could we desire? Amen. Amen. Amen.